This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, so here's a quote from Randall White in his book, Prehistoric Art. This is a sort of a statement of a position that I think is completely wrong. For the first 2.5 million years of the archaeological record, the only, facts of human, only artifacts of human beings and their hominid precursors were strictly utilitarian. Okay, so I think that's false. So, something called the sapient paradox, which believers in the cultural Big Bang around 40,000 years ago tend to talk about, is this. So, if the biology of our species was in place 200,000 years ago, or thereabouts, why did modern behaviour only emerge about 40,000 years ago? Um, of course, there are disbelievers in the Big Bang, <coughs> Brooks and McBreety among them, who say that there was instead a gradual ramping up of cultural innovation across the Middle Paleolithic. Um, I'm not sure what I think about that, but I do want to talk about artefacts which certainly go back to the Middle Paleolithic and even predate the existence of our species. And I want to talk about those objects in the context of asking questions about the dating of the, uh, the dating and the explanation of the emergence of art. So um, we, books on the history of art usually start with the Upper Paleolithic uh, and what struck people about those famous cave paintings that we have from southern France and northern Spain when they were first discovered were their, first of all, startlingly modern look and the, the, the apparent status as highly curated objects. They're like pictures on the walls of a rather exclusive gallery. They're very hard to get into. And there is something remarkable about those objects, uh, which gives them, I think, a, a reasonable claim to be more than a stage in slow cultural change. They are, as far as we know, I think, the first systematic practice of representation. And they're not elaborated versions of functional objects. I'm, by functional objects, I mean ob objects with an obvious practical function. They're not associated with uh, provisioning or shelter, for instance. Whereas the artefacts I'll talk about later on are not representational and they do belong to an obvious functional kind. Now that um, early view of uh, the Upper Paleolithic as representing, the, the cave paintings of the Upper Paleolithic as representing a kind of um, prehistoric high art led, uh, I think, inevitably to uh, a kind of extreme reaction on the other side, um, which included a general rejection of the idea that artefacts of this period can be usefully categorised as art at all. And so one these days reads in, 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 in works on the artefacts of this period a kind of uh, obligatory preface which claims to liberate us from various forms of cultural parochialism. And you can generally characterise that purported parochialism by two propositions. That is, in, in our culture, it is said, art is produced by and for individuals who have no other interest than in delighting in the works for their own sake and that all other cultures, it is assumed, are the same as ours in that respect. So that's the kind of cultural parochialism which people regularly complain against. Now something that they don't mention, <coughs> typically, um, I think is terribly important to our conception of art. Both our philosophical conception of it and our ordinary practice with respect to art. And that, this strikes me as key, actually, to the origin, understanding the origin of art. And that is the extent to which we treat artworks as expressions of the perspectives, feelings, and talents of their makers. So here's Nick Humphreys saying something along these lines. <coughs> we love beauty through the medium of our senses, but at the same time we love it 
<coughs> what we love is obviously not merely the sensory stimulus as such. For a start, we often need to be told that this is beauty before we will respond to it at all. We care deeply about genuineness and authenticity. We find a reproduction of a Rembrandt less valuable and surely less beautiful than an original. We marvel at the cave paintings at Lascaux only because we believe they were made by human beings and if, we were to, if it were to turn out that they were created by a freak flood, they'd become merely quaint. We may seem to love beautiful things as if they were indeed the things of beauty in itself that count for us, but our feelings about the thing is always a proxy for our feeling about some idealised person in the background. Now, I think that's probably a bit of an exaggeration there, so if I was going to discuss this in detail, I might quarrel with some, one or two of the things that, that he says. But overall, I think that's not a bad position to start from. So here's Paul Bloom um, saying much the same sort of thing. He talks about the depth of human pleasures, the way in which pleasures which seem to be derived from the surfaces of things depend on background conditions which if they turn out to be violated or destroy or undermine or at least change our pleasure. So the musical passage we enjoyed for its energetic brilliance turns out to be the product of speeded up recording. The picture we thought was hand painted turns out to be a photograph or well, that genre-breaking poem of the 16th century turns out to have been written last week. All these discovery of those things, if they don't destroy our pleasure, they certainly change it. So we are surrounded, I think, by works which manifest admirable features of their makers and which are enjoyed for exactly that reason. So in most plastic art making practices we see traces, literal visible traces of the artist's activity. Brush strokes and pencil marks, marks that report, record the process of shaping of a solid material or in the pattern of a woven basket or a blanket or a rug because those things are three-dimensional and provide a detailed record of the activity of the maker. Now there are genres which, which purposefully uh, obscure those processes. So the, a, uh, the smooth surfaces of a Canova sculpture or the precision, rather anonymous precision of a Mondrian. So there are works of that kind. They give us little sense of what went into the making. But we do marvel at the mysterious smoothness of the Canova and wonder how it was created and we admire Mondrian's sense of balance. The objects I'll talk about in a little while were, are exactly of that kind which display very vividly the marks of production on their surfaces. Now this connection be, that we have to the artist through the work I think is not just a cognitive connection, it's not just that we have certain beliefs about the process of making, it's a bodily connection to the artist's activity. So Galizzi talks about intercorporeality, as he calls it, the mutual resonance of intentionally meaningful sensory motor <coughs> behaviours that relate us to the object. Through simulated grasping, for instance, we see an object, we see an artwork, we have a simulated sense of what it would be like to grasp it, we also have a sense of a kind of revisiting of the making of the object. And there's evidence for this in a number of areas. I'll refer to one or two very briefly. So there's quite a lot of evidence that handwriting, seeing handwriting, activates areas of motor cortex that are used in the writing of letters. So when you see handwriting, you tend to simulate movements which, if really executed, would produce those letters. And that's apparently part of the explanation of how it is that we, with relative ease, are able to read words into very unword-like squiggles. And according to Galezi, again, similar patterns of activation underpin our sense of the actions undertaken by an artist. He gives the examples of Pollock and Giacometti, obviously very evident examples of that kind. 
So with that in mind, let's go back beyond the Upper Paleolithic to much earlier artefacts. The Acheulean industry, which began about one and a half million years ago, or thereabouts, I believe, which outlived several species, spread from Africa to Western Asia, parts of Europe, and produced many millions, I believe, we have of these long enduring stone objects which people call bifaces or hand axes. They constitute two worked sides of a stone cobble or flake that meet at a sharp edge. I'll show you one in a minute. They're tear or ovate in shape and they sometimes work to a very high degree of symmetry. They're worked by a complex process of heavy and, and light striking with other objects, stone for the heavy work and then bone and antler for the fine work. So there we have, uh, have an example of one. <coughs> That's from Northern Cape, but dated about 750,000 years ago at some banded ironstone, and you can see the way in which it's been shaped to um, display variation in the materials. Here's one from the UK, I think about 400,000 years ago, the Hoxney Axe, and it's in the British Museum. Um, it's a product of our direct ancestor, one of our direct ancestor species, our direct ancestor species. You can't see it in the, in the picture here, but there's a twist to the symmetry of the object which has preserved an embedded fossil. Probably deliberate. Uh, very large, not a useful butchery implement. Uh, very sharply pointed, that would easily break off if you started to use it. Uh, here in Olduvai, we find five, I think, uh, very finely worked um, hand axes, which, because of their very close similarity to one another, almost identical in size and shape, are taken to be the product of a single maker. Um, in white quartzite, very difficult material to work with, dated... Um, 600 to 400,000 years ago. Um, very large, 27 centimetres, where the average length for hand axes is about 13. Uh, they're very close matches to one another, and as I say, uh, they may be the work of a single craftsman. Here's an odd one from Cuxton in England. It's called a Fikron, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, very large said by the discoverer to be exquisite, almost flamboyant. You can see that, I think. There's also a cleaver, which is a sort of blunt-edged version of the hand axe of comparable size, which was discovered pretty much in the same place. So again, thought to be the work of the same person. Uh, the workmanship is extraordinary, despite the large size. There are no mistakes, such as step fractures across the wide expanse of the faces cross-sections along the long axis and across the hand axe, perfectly symmetrical. The cleaver edge straight and perfectly orthogonal to the long axis, you can't see that one, has been achieved by two immaculate opposing blows, one from each edge. So a lot of skill displayed here. Both weigh over a kilo and too large and too heavy to be used by a human. Then or now. Uh, about 240,000 years ago, I understand that's a preliminary dating, probably made by the same agent. So those are a few admittedly atypical instances from an industry that produced millions of these objects, which we can still see. Um, the overall construction seems to be over-designed relative to its purposes, such as extracting meat from carcasses. How should we understand these very large, spectacularly crafted instances of this artefact? So here's a proposal um, to start with. I think it's not unreasonable to suppose that the people who made them and observed them found them pleasing stimuli, perhaps because of a sexually selected preference for symmetrical objects. That may be the case. Um, but remember what I said earlier on about 
uh, the art as making, what I'll call the art as making hypothesis, the idea that we cannot understand art or the appreciation of art without understanding the way in which, uh, which artworks place us in a relation to their makers. So on that hypothesis, art, however broadly conceived, ought to be more than merely a surface of beauty. It should provide pleasure in the traces of a skillful performance, the performance of the maker. And hand axes, I think, are super stimuli of that kind. They display on their surfaces, as you will have seen from the earlier examples, exactly the marks of the blows that produce them. And they manifest a whole range of skills. They're worked in difficult materials which have unpredictable responses to striking. So the successful production of a hand axe is quite an achievement of, uh, when, it's, when it's a large one and made in, in difficult working materials. Sometimes, as we saw, the symmetry of the pattern is made more difficult to achieve by the imposition of a twist to the symmetry. Sometimes the size, and we've seen some very large ones, manifests skill in keeping shape and integrity under control in difficult circumstances. And they can't, they, <coughs> they, the production of these objects manifests such skills as ability to concentrate and to have patience in the performance of an undertaking, as uh, Penny Spickens in a recent paper has interestingly suggested. So in the light of those uh, objects, a few of which we've seen here, I think it's worth considering this vast period before the Upper Paleolithic as a period which represents what I'll call a systematic practice of aesthetic embellishment. Now, I, it would be difficult at this stage, I think, to go further than that, that and call these artworks, and I'm not doing that. I think we might want to say that if they're not artworks fully, they are pre-art or er art or proto-art, that they're significantly related to what we would eventually call without any reservations, works of art. But, and so there, here's an objection. Bowerbirds, they produce elaborate constructions full of striking visual detail designed to attract mates. But we don't want to say, do we, that bowerbirds make art or even proto-art or er art, or anything like art. So can we say that there's some kind of clear difference between those artifacts that I've been talking about and the bowers of bowerbirds? OK, I'm going to move on pretty quickly here. Um, so one thing you might say is, well, bowerbirds are just, just acting on instinct. And these hominids who produced hand axes were cognitively advanced enough to be doing something more than that. But that doesn't seem to be true. Um, we've got good reason to think that bower building is learned practice. So um, th there are all sorts of things that make that a plausible hypothesis. So unlike, say, peacock's tails, bowers are things over which the bird has control, and so it's, the po it's possible for the bird to exert control over the end result, which, of course, a peacock can't do over its tail. Bowers depend on the availability of materials, so flexibility in behavior is going to be an advantage for bower birds. Having a large brain, we know, is important for cultural evolution, and bower-building species have large brains relative to other species. And the species that build more complex bowers have larger areas of the brain that govern learning. Also, it seems, I'm not sure anybody's absolutely sure about this, that the capacity for bower construction develops 
so that choice of colour and quality of cork clearing and choice of twig size change and po possibly improve uh, with age of the bird doing it. It may even be that there's social learning in bowerbirds. So we see groups of young males building what seem to be practice bowers. Uh, there are reports, unpublished last time I looked, I must say, of a sort of apprentice system with young males allowed to watch males display from the female place. Some of these neophytes are then allowed to perform themselves. Okay, well, I won't go on about that. <coughs> So, uh, we don't, I think, want to say that bower building is instinctual. We want to say that it's a learned activity. It may involve social learning as well. So, how are we going to avoid saying that if hand axes are significantly related to art, bowers are not? Well, I think we've still got some lines of defence here. Um, <coughs> bowers do, I suppose people assume, function as honest signals, as people say, of desirable qualities in a mate. But I take it that it's unlikely that female bowerbirds, when they're watching the bower and watching the bird display in the bower, have a sense of those qualities. I think it's unlikely that they have a sense that what they are seeing is an indicator of those sorts of qualities. It's simpler, and I think just as explanatory, to suppose that it's simply how the bower is arranged and how the bird displays from, that matters from the point of view of motivating the female to mate with the male. Now, if that turned out to be not true, and female bower birds did associate the finished product with an act of making, then another defence against the proposition that bowerbirds make something like art would have, would have fallen. But I don't think we're in that position at the moment. And there are other defences. So we speak very naturally about traditions of making in art. Tradition is something that we naturally associate with art itself. And by tradition, I don't mean just a historically continuous practice that people generation after generation are doing the same thing. I don't think that's enough to have a tradition. A tradition involves a practice wherein the practitioner's conduct is modulated by knowledge of previous practice and by a desire to conform to that practice to some degree or perhaps to expand on it and perhaps indeed to transcend it but one should have beliefs and desires about the practice for it to count as a tradition. Otherwise, it's just a practice. And on current assumptions, again, one might eventually find this overturned, on current assumptions, I think we would not easily say that bowerbirds have traditions. So, uh, there's comfort, I think, for those who think that it would be madness to say that bowerbirds produce art. We're probably not forced into that position. What about hand axes, though? Was people's pleasure in the appearance of these objects <coughs> affected by their sense of the object's skillful making, which I've said we shouldn't assume in the case of bowerbird making? Well, <coughs> There's an interesting, that's an interesting question, and I don't think we really know the answer to it. But remember that the Acheulean is a very long period of time. It may have been that that didn't happen at the beginning, but perhaps at the time, hand, perhaps at the beginning of the period, when hand axes first came into existence, they were purely functional objects. Or perhaps they functioned like bowers, as signals of fitness without requiring awareness on the receiver's part of what is being signalled. But hand axes did endure for a very, very long time, a million and a half years. And human cognition 
and social complexity changed a great deal during that time. And at some stage, we know, human beings gained awareness of and pleasure in the manifestation of skills. We know that because we have that capacity now. So, here's a hypothesis, speculative, I, I agree. The emergence of spectacularly wrought hand axes in this period mark the point where people start to be conscious of hand axes as manifestations of skill. Did tradition emerge in this period? I think that's more doubtful. I would, I, I would think that what we know about the cognition of creatures at this, our ancestors at this time, which is perhaps not much, makes that a bit of a stretch. So I think that's doubtful. How could we find out about it? Well, one way to approach that would be to look very closely at variations, uh, regional variations in patterns of making. Because where you have traditions, you have divergences of ways of producing the thing according to local traditions. Um, there are studies of regional variation in hand axes, but I don't think that from them we have much of an answer to this question so far. And it's actually quite difficult to get an answer because differences in raw materials and other conditions can impose regional differences which might not then need to be explained in terms of tradition. So I think it's a, di it's a difficult question to answer, but I wouldn't at this stage want to say that hand axes constituted a tradition. So I think we've at least got a framework for placing activity in relation to our concept of art from this discussion. So I've noted three conditions relevant to calling to the decision about whether we call something art or closely related to art. First of all, that the production of an object is designed to be pleasing to sight or other senses. Secondly, there should be involvement in this pleasure of a sense of the work as making evident admirable capacities of the maker. And thirdly, there should be the influence of tradition in the process of making. So, another hypothesis to finish off with. I think it would be sufficient for something to count as an art-making practice if it satisfied all those conditions. I don't say it would be necessary and sufficient, but I say it would be sufficient. I say that bowerbird activity satisfies only the first of those that the hand axe production satisfies the first two, but possibly not the third, whereas the cave paintings of the Upper Paleolithic satisfy all three. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, good. veritable forest. Let me do it geographically. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Uh, six. Yeah, I see there's a less active slice over there. Yeah, seven. Right, let's see if we can do that. So, so Greg, um, uh, it looks as though winemaking is an art practice. Um, yeah, I mean... I, I, I can live with that, I think. I mean, um, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, what we're willing to call art is very contextually dependent, I think. And um, in a kind of anthropological context, um, I, I think, you know, the, the approach of anthropologists to this issue would, would, would be to favour the inclusion of that at least you would want to say that winemaking is, is, is sufficiently closely related to art. So maybe my three conditions would be better, better said to be conditions which made you confident that you were talking about art or something very closely related to art and which you would want 
so closely related to it so that the ex you would want to be careful that the explanations that you were giving for the, for the existence of the one overlapped significantly with the explanations you were giving for the existence of the other, something like that. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. So I'm puzzled by you think, saying that hand axes weren't um, a tradition. I mean, it, the hand axes of very similar form were created for one and a half, uh, well over a million years. Yeah. Um, and they require quite a bit of skill in the extraction of the flake from, a, from an underlying block. So it's mm. quite likely that some instruction of... Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, I, like I agree. More than, more than what is great. Yeah. Social learning, absolutely. I mean, it, it's inconceivable, I think, that there would have been such a long period of hand axe uh, production without social learning. But I think we can accept that there's social learning in bowerbirds. But we don't. Ha we w we wouldn't want to conclude from that that there that bowerbirds had traditions, because right, the existence of traditions. I just don't understand what um, is what's considered a tradition. But also, well, I, I I'm can, wondering, can I just one more? Yeah. Can, I'm wondering whether suppose it was the case that back 1.4 million years ago it wasn't a tradition, <coughs> but 400,000 years ago yeah. it was a tradition. Yeah. Yeah. But that uh, what they were making were similar with respect to both the skills involved and the form of the product. Would then, yeah. would you say that in 400,000 years ago, it was unequivocally an artwork, but 1.4 million years ago, it was possibly not, yes. uh, even though that the object looked exactly the same and was produced in exactly the same way? Well, OK, so um, I mean, I'm the way I've sort of set this up is I've tried to make it as hard for myself right. as I could. Sure. So, you know, I, I would be very happy to be argued into the position of saying that there was a tradition here and that we, we should feel comfortable with saying that these are art, significantly art related, and we, we don't have to worry about the nightmare of bowerbirds any longer. We just forget them. I, I just don't think we, we really know enough to, to be confident that there were, that the practices that produced hand axes were practices which essentially involved the having of beliefs and desires about previous production as a part of the explanation of what current would, practice. What would it take to Yeah, okay, so that's, that's, that's good. Well, I mean, if, suppose we had, uh, I mean, people have said, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is, you know, terribly convincing, but people have said that we can, we can uh, calibrate developments in human cognition by measuring brain size, so that... Um, to get beliefs, you, you need brain size of this, and to get beliefs about beliefs, you need brain size of that, and beliefs about beliefs about beliefs, you need brain size of that. Um, now, if, if somebody could come along and tell me that the creatures that made these had brains which it's very plausible to think uh, had that kind of metacognitive capacity, then I think it would be easier to think in these terms. But um, I'm just assuming that we don't think that 400,000 years ago people had that kind of metacognitive capacity. Mm. Okay. But if it turns out that, 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 that there's any evidence out there of any kind that people could plausibly be attributed the sorts of beliefs and desires that it would be necessary to think of this in terms of a tradition, I'd go for it. Yeah, can I uh, pick up on that just quickly and throw in perhaps another factor? Uh, Grimes Graves in Norfolk, uh, which is these extraordinary, well, they're not graves, but they're mines, and they go, and these are remarkable seams as you get in Norfolk of uh, flint. And there there's evidence, archaeological evidence, of actually divisions of labor. 
And these flints, as I understand it, have turned up in France and all over the place. So it does look as if they're specialist makers. Indeed, there are people who are good at doing one bit of the process rather than the other bit of the process. And that throws in another, perhaps, factor to think about is when do people become recognized as specialist makers, artists in our terms? And my sense is that with some of these uh, flaked objects, which are just ravishingly beautiful and skillful, that probably people got reputations for being rather yes. good at it. And yeah. again, these are intangible in terms of the historical record, but instinctively you can get a sense of that. Again, I, I, I absolutely agree, and I think it's extremely credible to suppose that there were uh, master crafts people in, the, in this industry. Uh, and that uh, it might be part of the evolutionary story here that um, by being such a master craftsman, you gained pupils, and that gaining pupils gained you all sorts of advantages. You got wealth um, as well. And ab absolutely. Yeah. I'm not sure ha whether you can get from that to the existence of a tradition in yeah, the yeah. sense that I described it. It's difficult to see what the evidence would be given what we've yep. got. Because yes. So, sorry, the, yep. no, number three, can I move on to... Yeah, yeah right. Sorry, Greg, I've got two comments actually. First is the form of question, very sound absurd, but it's a, not rhetorical. No That's a change. With the, sorry? sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that I like to hear what that means. Um, um, no problem with the kind of criteria, kind of thing, features or something like that, but I'm not quite sure why. I'm not saying there isn't a good reason. I'm not quite sure what your reason is for wanting a categorical criteria distinction, a category called art. And by the way, of course, the word art, what meant that, changed in different societies and over time with their own society, even in the last 500 years. But my, the point is that, can I just say what's related? It's the second comment I have, which is really bears on this. And that is, much as they say in their country, but I just don't agree. And the reason I want to destroy, I want to make a distinction here, I may have, and I want to relate to art history for this actually, I would, might want to draw a distinction between the two things which are not quite the same, namely an aesthetic response and admiration. Now, let me explain what I think. So, I certainly perceive in certain calligraphers, I mean, some of Hockney's are, I perceive, I mean, uh, Chinese and Japanese work, what I perceive is also the gesture, just as I see the gesture in speech. But then you say, why I want to do it? For example, I could respond, it's not clear to me that I would respond with, and I'm going to draw a real exception to this, the real point about the German tradition in uh, aesthetic here. What I would have the same reaction, certainly after the Romantic period, in the Romantic period, to a, real, a natural landscape. People went to look at natural landscape, yeah. hence the emergence of what's called, I think, the picturesque. Yeah. Just as much as I would have the same response as I have to the blinding of Gloucester in Lear, if I really witnessed that. However, the point is, what comes. I also have, when I treat it as quote art, I have another response. And that, in fact, is the basis of the whole of that German tradition from around 1800. Namely, I have an ironic response, what's called an ironic response, that is a dual response. What, on the one hand, I respond to it in a natural way without any second order of the world, and in a, but at the same time, I respond to it as unreal. Uh, representation by somebody. So I want to complicate this here. And indeed, uh, it seems to me, I want to, do, uh, I want to pull out different components of what you're calling an aesthetic response. And that's why I'm not sure about a single category that has multiple criteria for a thing called art. Well, OK, so I mean, there is a problem about what, do, uh, what does somebody with this view about art say about our ascetic appreciation of nature? Your view. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, Nick, Nick Humphrey himself says, well, uh, 
what's going on with the aesthetics of nature is that nature, objects in nature, uh, have certain features which are design-like and therefore at some level, not, not perhaps at the level of belief, but at some level they constitute kind of fakes which fool us into having a response which is a response to making so that we see these mountains and we see the sunset and we see butterflies and they the symmetry of the butterfly all right you don't it like it be, all right is, okay it's so it's the direction of explanation and so on because it seems to be what's primary what's primary there is that i find it beautiful and then right. i might say yeah. oh yeah i don't find it okay so i don't because it was made I, do, I, do, I, don't, I don't find that Nick's approach fully convincing, so I'm more inclined to say that there is a bigger difference between our responses to nature and our responses to art, art, aesthetic artefacts. I mean, that's, that's a happier category, perhaps, than, than art. Uh, and that we, 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 when it comes to aesthetic artefacts, to, is, to appreciate them as aesthetic artefacts, we could, we could pretend that they're natural objects, but to appreciate them as aesthetic artefacts is to appreciate them as things which manifest certain kinds of skills of their makers. Yeah. We've got to number four, have we? Who is that? Are you? Yeah, right, okay. Marina. Um, <laughs> Um, a couple of things. One is um, we define something, whatever, you know, we define it as art. This is, think about embushment paintings. Yeah. Maybe 2,000 years ago, maybe 20,000 years ago, they're very difficult to date. Um, but until David Lewis Williams comes and says, actually, they're not depicting animals, they're not about depictions of scenes, but they are to do with trance, states of trance. The whole thing changed, and everybody's looking at it differently now. So we're not saying this is art for that purpose, but we're saying, wow, well, Lewis Williams is interpretation. So that looks like a net, but it's not a net because they didn't have nets. That's the effect that they saw when they were taking hallucinogenous um, drugs, and uh, that's the state of trance. So that changes the interpretation. Well. Okay, so I mean, uh, maybe not everybody knows this story, but Lewis Williams has this view according to which parietal art, uh, paintings on the walls of caves, are essentially the projections onto walls of mental images induced by states of altered consciousness due to the taking of drugs. So, I mean, I, I'm not you know, particularly a believer in that hypothesis, and I, I don't know how widely believed that hypothesis is. But I'm not sure if that hypothesis turned out to be true, what, it's, what I've said today that I would then have to retract. No, I'm not contradicting you. I'm okay. saying that if we... That, that, by the way, is pretty current now. It's pretty dominant, that hypothesis. Um, and it has changed the way the paintings are being looked at. So that they're not even, I mean, the, the whole art has been suspended at the moment under the Lewis Williams interpretation. I, 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 I offer no hypothesis about cave art. Yeah. I take it to be very close to a datum that cave art is, if not art in some special restricted sense, at least art in a much broader sense and certainly something that we would want to bring within the sphere of the art full, as it were, however it turned out to be that uh, that art was produced, I suppose. And then I just had another quick point, and that is the winemaking. Winemaking as art, it fits the description, so do lots of other activities. Yes. Um, that's not a problem, and you didn't see it as a problem. I'm glad you didn't see it as a problem. In fact, it's not a problem. I think where the problem is, is where we then translate from, we go from art to artist. It seems that that jump is a difficult one when we call 
somebody an artist, uh, but it's okay to call the activity an art. It's the same for science. You know, you may be doing something that is classified as science, but you're not necessarily a scientist. And the classification of being an artist. I agree. Being an artist and making art is a big difference. And also the point about art has changed hugely. Yeah. So often I say to my students, yeah. I'll show you two different, three different types of contemporary art. We call it art, but they're so different, they shouldn't be all called art. You should have different words for different things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably in nomenclature as well, but it, it's in that gap between art and the artist. And the artist is a profession and blah, 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 all the rest of it. Well, for my purposes, artist means somebody who engages systematically in the practice of producing aesthetically embellished objects. And I, I don't mean anything more than that, I think. Yeah, the, this question of whether we can use the term art to traditions that don't have that concept, when in St Andrews a Ghanaian sculptor turned up and, to do a doctorate and had a rather unworkable topic, and we negotiated that he would look at the use of African art by Epstein Moore and British artists. He didn't have any French, so we couldn't get him going on Picasso. And I thought, and I said to him at the beginning, you're probably going to show that Moore and Epstein so on completely misunderstood what the African artist was doing. And he came up with an answer that they didn't, that the African artists were doing certain things with the figure. And he said that to deny um, the African artist, the, the, the notion that they could make art was patronizing, which I think is right. But we can take it back into that period, providing we don't then impute to them the whole very self-conscious theoretical aesthetic baggage that we have. So I have no problem in these things being called, the act is being called art, providing it's... And I think that very self-conscious artificial aesthetic baggage is the, is the possession of a, of, a, of a tiny minority Absolutely. of Western folk. I mean, it's not what most people, even in the West, Think about Absolutely. art. It's sort of, it turns out to be Immanuel Kant and the followers of, of, of yeah, that philosophy. Kant is a disaster, but let's not so go there. Uh, yes. Um, I was struggling with your, your third criteria, the, um, the tradition right. criteria, because it, it seems to me that the Bowerbirds have a tradition. It may be a very simple one, but it qualifies you know, for every aspect of what I would call a tradition in that it's learned. It's passed on from generation to generation. It produces beautiful objects and it goes on through time. So as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I think I can consider that a tradition. Second element would be that in more recent definitions of art, you know, what, what makes it distinctively artful would be the reaction against the tradition. I, you know, if, if, if this is meant to attract mates and you know, if we're going for that theory, then skill is not the only thing. It's also the imagination and the innovation that goes into producing something that looks very different from what everyone else was doing. So the commercial tradition of master painters having, having disciples and, and you know, the, the sort of the commercial dynamic that hangs together with that doesn't strike me as a, as a particularly um, distinctive element okay. of art in itself. So let, so let me say just something quickly about why we need to distinguish between, why we need to have at least some slightly heavier duty concept of tradition than the one, of the, the one I think you're working with. So I mean, we don't want to end up saying that driving on the right or driving on the left is a tradition. It's a practice. It's something that we do and which we learn from other people. It's stable over time. It would be absurdly overrating it to call it a tradition. So you want to have something more to constitute a tradition. My account of tradition does that because there are many reasons why you drive on the side of the road. And I always forget which side we drive on. The left. Okay. So we drive on the left. There are many, there are good reasons. <laughs> Where do you live? <laughs> Not going to York, that's for sure. <laughs> there are good reasons for driving on the left. 
but it's not one of the reasons that you have for driving on the left that people used to drive on the left. You drive on the left because people do that now and if you don't do that, you're going to get into trouble. But the analogy doesn't work very well because I agree with, with what you say about driving, but the essential difference here is that the bowerbirds you know, produce beautiful things. I would call that habits, that driving, you know, practical habits, driving on the left side of the road, but is distinctively different from producing beautiful objects that are meant to attract whatever, whatever attraction. But I don't think we want to say that a practice gets to be a tradition just because it's a practice of producing beautiful things, because then it seems to me that's all it is, a practice of producing beautiful things. Does tradition in that sense require a certain sense of almost historical perspective of antecedents? Or? Well, it's, uh, on my account, it's a, it's a, a, a practice is a tradition when part of the explanation for the continuation of the practice is that the practitioners have beliefs and desires about past practices. But sorry, but uh, that's, that's quite, quite a tough criteria. I'm not, maybe really maybe it's right. like a craft. You know, we have aesthetic craft, and we have the artists that are dealing with perceptual relationships. I mean, you know, we've lost all that now because everyone's an artist, which I don't agree with. Well, well, somebody, the craft was, I thought, quite a good word, really. <coughs> somebody well, comes from a tradition where there is no tradition. They come from a subculture, no tradition, and they produce something that's fantastic. The fact that it hasn't come out of a tradition, I agree with your definition of tradition, right. that means it can't be deemed to be artistic. But the question what, what, from Colin, wasn't somebody, um, yes, yeah, so I'm neglecting this side. Yeah. One, two, then Colin. Um, an alternative hypothesis. Um, I had an anatomy and uh, anthropology professor in South Africa who took us to study um, the rocks in Aldermite Gorge. And he said that it's all to do, if you can see my, my hand, a muscle called the opponens pollicis that enables you to do this as opposed to chimps that do that. And that enabled us to make tools and cave paintings. And it's got nothing to do with big brains, just that muscle. Look, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are other things to be said about the necessary <coughs> conditions that have to be in place for the sorts of activities that I've been talking about here to emerge. And, and you know, those, um, the things you're pointing to might be among those things. But I don't think that those, those things are crucial to the decision about whether we say that those practices of making constitute an art. Well, one of, one of the really big things here clearly is when you make something that stands for something else. It's essentially a kind of linguistic thing where... Well, I don't want that, actually. I don't want to have a condition of, sim of symbolic significance. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a condition. I'm saying it's, a, it's something that comes in pretty early. I mean, what I want to say is well, not necessarily a result of big, having big brains. Yeah, oh, a question at the back there, then Colin. Then. Um, so thanks, I think it's already been touched upon, um, so I hope I'm not repeating anything. Um, I have a bit, I'm, I've got a bit of a confusion and a worry um, in your argument that you're happy to say, one of the worries I think it was Madden said, uh, well one of the worries you might have about the bowerbirds is that uh, they're, it's not intentional but you said they've got control, um, so it seems like it's deliberate, they've got intention, and then you said, but this isn't enough, it's got to be a second order, um, something second order, it's got to be they have beliefs and desires about the practice. And that seemed to me like an assumption that was a premise that was smuggled into the argument. I was like, well, no, my, my intuition is, unlike yours, that bowerbirds do make art. And it seems like you're going to want something quite, <laughs> I know that may be crazy. <laughs> um, but I, 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 thought, I, I wanted to see an argument as to why we should be that strict in require, what, what is it about being second order that is the crucial thing that makes it different? So if you take your example of uh, driving a car, do you think that having beliefs and desires about the practice of driving a car on a particular side of the road is going to do enough? Is that really what's relevant? Um, 
So, I, I, so I don't I'm know, not I, getting I, it with the car example because I, I, I said that I didn't want to treat which side we drive on the road as a tradition for that very reason that, that your beliefs and desires about the practice previous practice have nothing to do with your reasons for driving on the side of the road that you do drive on. Can I suggest that driving on the left side of the road, which is a practice, can become a condition <coughs> tradition in certain political contexts? Much like the switch to decimal, decimal currency or, or the surrender of the pound, which is a practice mm. that becomes... You know, they, they, we could have a tradition of driving on the other side of the road on certain days because we want to mark you know, the death of the martyrs in the revolution or something like that. That would be a tradition. Yeah. It's just that the, the, our convention of driving on one side of the road is not a tradition as we currently practice it. So why is that, why is that the relevant thing? So you've already given them intention, right? You've already given the bowerbirds intention. Why isn't that enough? Why, why should, can you give us a reason why we should want more from, a, from, from the bowerbirds to, to allow them to have art? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting the, 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 pump, the intuition pump here as to why having it second order makes the relevant difference. Well, so the thought was um, art, to, to be comfortable in talking about art as something which a creature systematically engages in, you want the notion of tradition. Uh, Colin. So just to comment about both of the key features that you think distinguish what animals do from us, the notion of tradition, and the, no and the requirement of a subjective interpretation by the viewer. Um, yeah. First of all, I think your, your conclusion might be different if you talked about bird song rather than bower birds, where there's clear evidence of tradition, the taxonomy of the development of songs taught from fathers to offspring, novelty, progressing, uh, inherent of genetics. That's social learning, but, but I'm, I'm separating the question, is there social learning in this practice from the question, does this practice constitute a tradition? The way I define these things allows you to say there is social learning, as there is with bowerbird production, I am assuming, but not to say that it constitutes a tradition. Another point, the point about bowerbirds is that um, it turns out they have a preference for blue objects, yep. as you know. Um, um, and there's clearly high value in, in blue objects. But there are very few blue objects in nature, so blue, so blue is rare. So, so it's the use of blue is a relatively recent development. There are things like beer cans and bottle tops and, and so on. Close pace. So clearly, has been a change in the behaviour, with presumably new sorts of interpretation, new value being attached, and this new colour has arrived. That's just a comment which you've partly with. The question of the subject to the interpretation of the observer is surely. Slippery, philosophically slippery argument, isn't it? If you're appealing to your assumption about the subjectivity of a female barber looking at the, the product by looking at it, you're saying it's hard to imagine that by looking at a pretty display they infer anything about the nature of the, the display. Well, how, how would you know? How, how would you know? Does it really matter? And do you well, I guess. Terms? If you're yeah. zombies, zombies who go. To take modern and continue to go to take modern, and you know that they have no emotional experiences, isn't their behaviour to define, as it were, the social utility of whatever they're doing? Yeah, well, okay, so I'm going to appeal at this moment to something you will hate, I'm sure, which is Morgan's Canon. And I, <laughs> you hate, yeah. So I'm going to say that if, if, if the hypotheses, if you can explain bower bird, uh, female bower bird, responses to bower production and display without invoking the hypothesis that she is making inferences to the fitness of her prospective partner, then that's a better thing to do. Well, ultimately for the partner. Well, she um, must be attributing it to the partner. It's not being really attraction to the bower. She's attracted to the partner. Oh, I, I'm not denying that she's not attracted to the partner. What I'm suggesting well, I is implausible know. is that she's making inferences about the fitness yeah. of 
Yeah, you see with it. I just wanted to make a point. God, you, you, you mentioned how, when you were talking about the axes, you made the point about the ones that you were particularly felt were going above and beyond what an axe would need to do. Yeah were actually not usable as axes. And I was wondering whether that was another point of difference that you were making, which is about <coughs> utility. Yes. And when things go above and beyond what they need for their apparent function, um, and maybe become. whether that might be another area of distinction. And I wanted, if you could comment on that. Well, the Bowers, OK. So um, right. So maybe I just say a couple of things there. I mean, first of all, it's probably worth saying that, according to some people, Hand axes themselves, even the simplest ones, are over-designed. So what preceded hand axes were just bits of stone with, where you sort of hit it, cut it in half, and it creates a sharp edge. Some people say that that does just as well for the, for the purpose of cutting into uh, the flesh of a dead animal or smashing bone in order to get the marrow out as a hand axe, which is well worked on both sides and has a sharp edge all go going all the way around, which must be slightly difficult to hold as well. So the whole genre of hand axes is subject to this doubtfulness about its, its utility relative to the amount of work that goes into it. And so those ones that I was showing there on that hypothesis would just be the more extreme examples of sort of, of uselessness, if you see what I mean. Um, so, sorry, now I've but forgotten. Still with the bowers, the bowers are always used as bowers, as opposed to this sort of thing. But the bowers are just, they're not used for anything except to attract the female. They don't have, it's not, it's not that they're, so they're not functional, they don't emerge from a functional So I was a little bit concerned with your response to um, your no. previous point um, about uh, saying that tradition is part of, following on from a tradition is part of your, defini your definition of art, which is why bowerbirds can't be producing art. Because, it, I, I mean, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I was, it just felt like, well, then what you've done is given us your definition of art and it happens to be in line with your intuition that bowerbirds don't produce art. And I was thinking about things like uh, a lot of features in architecture, say, or I mean, certainly in advertising and things like that, um, aren't necessarily produced uh, with the intention of the pleasure that somebody takes from it uh, being mixed with an acknowledgement of the skill of the person who produced it. And there are certainly lots of features of architecture that are very, very clever and minimal that look unintentional, which is what makes them so great. Only other architects or other people who knew a lot about it um, may be able to appreciate that. And so yeah. I, I'm worried about kind mm. of ruling that out. I mean... Yeah, good. Okay, yeah. Right. So, um, obviously within the, this very broadly defined area of the art world, which we, we're going to include uh, advertising companies and, and people who think up you know, adverts and posters and stuff, there are going to be multiple traditions at work, as it were, that you're saying that at least some of this activity uh, is aesthetically relevant uh, and really ought to count, in my very broadest terms, as, 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 as within the sphere of the art broadly defined, but it doesn't, it's not there, be, it's not there because of, it, it lies outside the traditions that we, that we have, because it's not done for... You do it without rather than doing it with the intention of the pleasure that other people take being kind of tied to their acknowledgement of your skill. Yes. You may be using your skill intentionally to make it look like you've done something simple or unskillful um, that people don't even realize that they're appreciating in a sense. Certainly in advertising, you don't want to look at, I mean, you might not think that that's an art, but you don't want to look at a big board and think, oh, that's beautiful, 
I'm so impressed by the advertising company who made that. You want to think, oh, that's beautiful. Now I want to buy a can of Coke or something. Oh, okay. You know, like so that's, sorry, I so think I misunderstood. It's a very different intention. Um, but the same with certain kinds of architecture. You may look at it and think, oh, it's beautiful, but it may be very, very simple or minimalistic architecture. It may um, kind of incorporate things that you wouldn't even be aware of, but actually make your uh, experience in the building a lot more pleasurable or aesthetic where what you're trying to do is disguise your skill as the architect. And that's kind of the real skill in it, is um, making it not look difficult, making it not look skillful, making it look easy. But if you don't have that second, second order intention for the person's pleasure to derive partly from or to be tied to an acknowledgement of your skill, then you miss your second criteria, which means that certain kinds yes. of architecture would be off the... So I think, I think we got a bit confused to start with because I thought your point was that these examples that you're describing constituted a violation of the third condition concerning tradition. I think what you're saying is that they constitute a violation of the second condition, which is that there should be awareness on the part of the receiver or, or that the, what it, the stimulus is... Uh, a manifestation of certain kinds of skills. And you're saying that in these cases, uh, that's exactly what we don't want to happen. Uh, sorry, wait, so the second condition is just an awareness on the part of the receiver. Surely, yeah. it's a, surely it's a desire on the part of the artist, because what I like about the bowerbirds, bowers, is that I see them and I think, wow, these bowerbirds, it's beautiful, and how skillful were these amazing bowerbirds to make this wonderful bower. So if that's all it needs, then it is art, because I'm appreciating it for the skills of the bower. But that's you. But that's you. That's, that's not a female bower. That's not a female. That's your reaction. That's exactly the reaction I'm saying we shouldn't attribute to the female bower. Well, why do you need it to be a female bower unless... Exactly. What's relevant about that condition is something in the mind of the bower bird creating the art. I mean, right. because I'm, I'm an audience, I'm just not the intended audience. I'm not, I'm not getting that, I'm afraid. So I'm I would assume, I think, that... I mean, just as I would assume that the females are not having thoughts about the ways in which th this stimulus manifests admirable, desirable qualities on the part of the maker, I would also think that it's unlikely that the makers, in their making, are intending to produce something that manifests those skills. Whether it's art, according to you, depends upon whether somebody else treats it as art or as in Well, it seems in your answer that that's what you're saying. In other words, whether X is art depends upon how the perceiver, receiver, engager, whatever, treats it. Yeah, I, see, I, I, I mean, there yeah, was you're, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. My mum wasn't on. I, sorry, it turned out on your thing that yeah. it couldn't have been on because my mother simply didn't have those things. Well, no way, actually. Well, your mum probably did, actually. She might have found it difficult to articulate that. But, but look, I take your point. I take your point. It's we probably mind. do need, additionally, a condition, that's interesting, which says something like, and the maker should, in the making... Well, I'm not sure. Actually, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure you would want... The receiver, it must Yeah, I'm not sure. Would it be so terrible if it ended up that, that my definition of art was kind of um, receiver-dependent in this way? I'm not sure it I don't, I, would. I, I, but I, anyway, I, it's I, a I good point. I driven down this defensive path. <laughs> I, I think it's worth, I, I need to think about that. That's what what only Greg and I can see at the back of the room is that there are bottles of wine, fruit juice and other things being poured out. So I think uh, that provides a, a key. Could I, um, could I thank the, the organisers um, for what has been a, a very extraordinary day. I've already said you know, to have something where you've got big papers